Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, so let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. So today, I'm going to talk about Dane filling and not compliments that you regularly cover. This is joint work with Eric Cheesebro, Jason DeBlois, Neil Hoffman, Christian Millichap, and Preetip Mondal. And some subset of this is joint with um, just Hoffman and Millichap. So the setting for the story I'm going to tell today is the world of cussed hyperbolic three manifolds. These are quotients of hyperbolic space H3 by some discrete subgroup of PSL2C. And more specifically, um, we're going to be interested in the world of orientable, connected, and finite volume cusp hyperbolic three manifolds. So here, finite volume is an important condition. This implies that all of the cusps are, of our manifold have torus cross sections. So an overarching question and general theme of this talk, um, but I'll phrase it as a question, is what hyperbolic three manifolds can cover or can be covered by a knot complement. So knot complements are a important subclass in, in this world of manifolds, um, very well studied. And so it's natural to ask, um, what can I have covering a knot complement or what can I have um, below a knot complement in a cover? So for example, sort of a, a natural first, more specific question to ask is, can a hyperbolic knot complement cover another knot complement? So can I have some S3 minus K prime covering S3 minus K? So the answer to this is yes. Um, Berge knots furnish an example of this. Um, and so you might wonder, well, how many uh, knot complements can cover another knot complement? Can I have two things up here, S3 minus K prime and S3 minus K double prime? So that can potentially happen, but the cyclic surgery theorem of Kohler, Gordon, Luke, and Shalin says that that's the limit. There are most two such covers um, that cover this way. So, um, so this gives a fairly good answer to this question. Um, there, it's still an open question, sort of to completely characterize all knots that have this property. Um, but maybe for this talk, I'll, I'll broaden the question a little bit and ask a different question. So my new question, Q double prime, is going to be, can a hyperbolic knot complement be commensurable with another knot complement? So let me define um, what I mean by commensurable. So two hyperbolic manifolds, M1 and M2, are said to be commensurable if there is a manifold N that is a finite cover of both. So I have these two manifolds M1 and M2, and N sitting above is a finite cover. And so this, this, this property commensurability is a um, equivalence relation. So this partitions our world of manifolds into commensurability classes. And this is actually a very natural way to organize hyperbolic manifolds into classes. So immediately, now that we know the definition, the answer to this question is yes, because the previous question gives us an affirmative answer, because if I have some S3 minus K prime covering S3 minus K, these things are commensurable. So as before, though, we might wonder how many. How many can I have in a commensurability class um, and so in this case, it's not known how many can be in a commensurability class, but it's conjectured, um, this is a conjecture of Reed and Wash, that there are at most three knot complements in a hyperbolic commensurability class. So we get the same answer as with the previous question where we were requiring that the knots were covering other knots. Um, once again, we have this this bound on how many knot complements can be in a commensurability class, conjecturally. Um, this bound is in fact realized, both from results of Sintichel and Stern and Hoffman. So Hoffman actually produces an infinite number of commensurability class, each of which has three knot complements. Okay, so 
a major step towards solving this conjecture was made by Boileau, Boyer, Sabanu, and Walsh. So they um, showed that the conjecture holds for knots that do not admit hidden symmetries. So M has a hidden symmetry. If there, are, if there is a symmetry of a finite index cover of M, that is not a symmetry of M. So M has some cover N up here, and there's some symmetry of N um, that's not just some lift of a symmetry of, of M downstairs. So this is, this is where the name hidden symmetry comes from. You can think of the symmetry as hiding in the cover, and it's not visible in the manifold M that maybe you actually care about. So this is one way to de define this, um, but another characterization, which is equivalent, is that M irregularly covers a hyperbolic orbifold. So again, we see covers showing up, and in fact, here we see for the first time irregular covers showing up. Um, and so this is getting back to the, to the title of the talk. So, so this is what it means to have hidden symmetries. So Boiler, Boileau, Boyer, Sabano, and Walsh showed that, showed that um, maybe using the definition on the right here, if M does not irregularly cover a hyperbolic orbifold, then the conjecture holds. So, um, so we're led to um, trying to understand hidden symmetries and knot complements. And this phenomenon actually appears to be quite rare among knots. So a second conjecture, conjecture two, um, comes from Neumann and Reed. They conjectured that with the exception of the figure eight knot and the two dodecahedral knots, no hyperbolic knot complement has hidden symmetries. So there's exactly three knots for which we know they have hidden symmetries, i.e. we know they irregularly cover an orbifold, and it's conjectured those are the only three. There are no others. Okay? And in fact, for these three knots, it's known that conjecture one holds. Um, in particular, the figure eight knot is not commensurable with any other knot complement. The dodecahedral knots are commensurable with each other, but nothing else. So in both of those, those classes, there are um, fewer than three. So conjecture one holds for these guys. And so taking conjecture two along with the result of Boileau, Boyer, and Sabanu, and Walsh, this implies conjecture one. So in other words, if we want to try to prove conjecture one, we should try to prove conjecture two. At least this is one possible approach you could take. So, so the focus now is on conjecture two, trying to show that no knot complements can emit hidden symmetries. So if we're interested in hidden symmetries of knot complements, there's a criterion of Neumann and Reed that's going to be very helpful. So they say that a knot complement M equals S3 minus K has hidden symmetries if and only if M irregularly covers a rigid cusped orbifold. So, um, so we already had that hidden symmetries were equivalent to irregularly covering an orbifold, and so for knots this gives us a much stronger criterion. Um, the orbifold in particular has a rigid cusp. So what does that mean? So a rigid cusp orbifold is an orbifold with a cusp um, cross-section homeomorphic to one of the pictured two-dimensional orbifolds here. So these are all um, topologically spheres, but they have, each one of them has three cone points. So at each of these cone points, there's a label. So um, if a cone point is labeled two, for example, the, it's gonna have a cone angle around that point. So you can think of that point as a singularity, and there's a cone angle around that point that's two pi divided by two. So in general, if um, a singularity is labeled by n, the cone angle will be two pi divided by n. So there are three of these rigid cusped orbifolds. They're all three pictured here. And these are called rigid, sorry, there are three of these rigid orbifolds. Um, and these are called rigid orbifolds because they have a unique Euclidean structure. So the, the Euclidean structure 
So if, if, I'm, if we're talking about hyperbolic three orbifolds, um, the, the metric on the cusp is induced by the hyperbolic metric and it's always going to be Euclidean metric. And for these, this Euclidean metric is unique. Um, this metric comes from quotientine Euclidean plane by a triangle group. So this is an important restriction and, and a very uh, severe restriction because, so if I have, um, say, a knot complement S3 minus K covering some rigid cusp orbifold Q, then if I just focus on the cusp cross section, in Q I have one of these rigid two orbifolds, and in S3 minus K I have a Euclidean torus that covers it. And so the fact that this um, two orbifold has a rigid geometry um, imposes very strong conditions on the geometry of the, of the torus in the cusp of, of the knot complement. Um, so in particular, this also imposes um, strong restrictions on the cusp field and the invariant trace field of the knot complement. So given this um, criterion, our new goal should be to try to find obstructions to knot complements covering rigid cusped orbifolds. Uh, in other words, I want to try to show that knot complements cannot cover rigid cusped orbifolds if I want to show that they cannot have hidden symmetries. Okay, so toward this end, um, so for this talk, um, so I guess, I, I guess sort of a broad ambitious goal, of course, would be to prove conjecture too. But this is maybe a little bit too ambitious. Um, so in, in this case, you know, what we want to do is maybe narrow it a bit, maybe um, try to find large classes of knot complements for which this conjecture holds. So this is a somewhat more tractable, tractable um, problem. So for us, this is going to come in the form of finding large classes of knot complements that come from Dane filling other manifolds. So to, to begin to, um, to explain um, where we're going with this, let me let N be a hyperbolic manifold with cusps C0 through Cn. And so I'm going to Dane fill all of the cusps of N except for C0. C0 I'll, left, I'll leave unfilled. So for, for the other cusps on each um, torus cross section, I'm gonna choose a closed curve alpha sub i and I'm going to glue, um, so I'll, I'll cut the cusp off at CI, and then I have this alpha sub I, and then I'm going to take a solid torus, and I'm gonna glue it to this, to this torus in N, so that the meridian of the solid torus glues to alpha sub I. Uh, this is called Dane filling along the slope alpha sub i. And so the resulting manifold I'll call N of alpha. Um, and so, and the situation um, that I care about, we're going to assume that N of alpha is covered by a knot complement and covers an orbifold so the knot complement will be S3 minus K, orbifold is Q, okay? Um, and so each of these solid tori that I glued into the cusps has a core curve, which I'll call gamma sub I. And so I can project all of the gamma sub I curves, which are geodesics in N of alpha. I can project these down to Q. And in Q, I can drill these out. So when I drill these out of Q, I get a manifold, a, sorry, an orbifold, which I'll call Q naught, Q zero, okay? And so um, what I'd like to happen, what I'd like to be the case is that I would like there to be a cover from N 
down to Q0. So I've drawn this, I've drawn this as, as a dotted line because there's some question as to whether or not this cover exists. In fact, uh, we don't expect that it'll always exist, um, but often it will. But for now, let's just assume it exists so we can sort of get an idea of why we're doing this. So if I have this situation um, where I have this cover and, and I also want this cover um, to be such that the diagram shown here commutes, then what are we going to use this for? Well, I'm trying to obstruct knots having hidden symmetries. I'm trying to find large classes of knots that do not have hidden symmetries. So if I were to assume that, so I'm going to vary my alpha, my Dane fillings. So there's many ways to do Dane fillings. Um, so that gives me infinitely many. So maybe I do uh, infinitely many Dane fillings such that all of them are covered by knot complements. And so if I assume that for each of these Dane fillings, my orbifold Q that I cover has a rigid cusp, um, then, well, if I have a rigid cusp in Q, that's a topological condition. So when I drill out all of these projected gamma I's in Q, although that's going to change the geometry and Q naught is going to have a different, it's going to be different geometrically than Q, um, I'm not doing anything near this rigid cusp. So topologically, I'm not changing anything near this cusp. So it's not changing topologically. And since its geometry is determined by its topology, it is still rigid in Q naught. So if Q has a rigid cusp, then Q naught also has a rigid cusp. So in this situation now, I have N covering a rigid cusp orbifold. So in other words, if I can find, if if there exists all these fillings of N so that I have a knot upstairs covering a rigid cusp orbifold downstairs, then I know that my original N must cover a rigid cusp orbifold. And so my hope is that in this situation, if I can start with, if I can start with an, a manifold N, um, that I can show cannot cover a rigid cusp orbifold, then I can say now that any any time I fill N, I get something that does not cover a rigid cusp orbifold. And this is where I get my large class of knots. So in other words, I'm replacing studying these infinitely many covers of knots S3 minus K down to Q with studying a single cover N down to Q naught. Okay, so... Um, so the question still remains though, I need, I need this cover down from n down to q naught to exist. So in what situation does this actually exist? So, so I need to make a definition. So we'll choose epsilon greater than zero to be smaller than the shortest, the length of the shortest geodesic in n. Um, and so with that initial restriction on epsilon, I'll let m be a Dane filling of some subset of the cusps of N. So in the case we care about, it'll be all but one cusp of N. Then M is said to be epsilon dN twisted filling of N if, first of all, every core curve gamma sub I coming from the filling solid tori has length less than epsilon over dN. So this dN is just a constant that depends on the volume of N. I won't define it, it's not really important, it's just some constant. Um, and every other geodesic in M has length at least epsilon. So um, a, a, a good way to summarize this definition is M is epsilon dN twisted if all of the very short geodesics in M come from my Dane filling core curves. Okay. So, um, so this lemma gives us what we want. If M is an epsilon dn twisted filling of n, and p from m to q is an orbifold cover. Then there's a cover n to q naught, q naught being this q minus projected gamma i curves, such that the diagram in the previous slide commutes. So, in other words, if we want to play this, if we want to run this um, this this uh, game here then this is the condition we want. We want to make sure that all of the short geodesics 
in my filled manifold are coming from the cores of my solid tori. And really what this definition is getting at is geometric convergence. So it's a theorem of Thurston that if I do um, sufficiently long Dane fillings, so if I, for example, have a sequence of Dane fillings of a manifold where the length of the filling curve, so this is the length in the Euclidean metric um, on the filling torus, if this length goes to infinity, then the three manifold, the, the filled manifolds converge geometrically to the unfilled manifold. And furthermore, the core geodesics, their lengths converge to zero. So if I have a sequence of Dane fillings so that the curves are so that the filling curves are becoming long, then eventually for an F out in the sequence, um, these will be epsilon dn twisted fillings. Okay, so um, so what do we get out of this? So the first theorem I want to talk about is joint with Hoffman and Millichap. It says if M equals S3 minus K is a not complement that is an epsilon dn twisted filling of a fully augmented link, then it has no hidden symmetries. So this gives us a very large class of not complements without hidden symmetries, um, modulo defining what fully augmented link means. So a fully augmented link, I'll just show you how to construct one. Start with any knot, um, and then I'm going to partition the crossings into twist regions, like so. A twist region is just a collection of uh, twists, basically, just what the picture shows. And then for each of these, I'm going to augment it by a circle. So I have three red unlinked circles that I've added here. Um, so now my my knot has become a four-component link, and then I can reduce the crossings. Um, in these regions, modulo two, this is a homeomorphism of the link complement. So from three to four, um, this is actually the same link complement. It's uh, not difficult to see. So this guy pictured in the fourth frame is my fully augmented link. And in fact, the filling I'm doing, although I didn't specify in the statement of the theorem, I'm gonna be filling along these um, red circles called crossing circles. So, and I'm gonna leave the gray component unfilled. So this is actually the filling that I want to do. And if I do that, and I and I do this with long enough filling curves, then I should get something epsilon dn twisted, and so this will have no hidden symmetries. Okay, so um, the last uh, few results are going to be joint with Cheesebro, Du Bois, Hoffman, Millichap, and Mondel. Um, so these also all, all use the same sort of idea, although the epsilon dn twisted um, terminology won't come up in these. So um, for the first one, let S3 minus K sub i be a sequence of not complements converging geometric to, geometrically to S3 minus L. So if each of these knots in the sequence covers a rigid cusp overfold, then we can say that S3 minus L has hidden symmetries. So this again gives us a way to, to construct many infinite families of knots which don't, um, which don't emit hidden symmetries. Just take your favorite link complement that you know does not have hidden symmetries and do Dane fillings along, um, do, do Dane fillings in such a way that you get knot complements and so that the length of your filling curve, um, filling curves goes to infinity so that you get this geometric convergence. Um, so this theorem taken with um, previous work um, with Millichap, where we showed that two bridge links do not admit hidden symmetries, um, gives us this other theorem. It says that if N is a hyperbolic two bridge link, then at most finitely many orbifolds resulting from filling N are covered by not complements with hidden symmetries. So here I'm taking a two bridge link. These are all two component links and I'm filling one of the components and all but finitely many um, ways of filling this. Um, so I'm allowing any orbifold filling of this. So I haven't really defined an orbifold filling, but there's a more general way to do Dane filling 
that may give you an orbifold. So this is very general. Um, so anything you get that's covered by a knot complement, that knot complement does not admit hidden symmetry. So again, we're getting very large classes of knot complements not emitting hidden symmetries. And then the last um, result that I want to that I want to quickly mention is um, that the figure eight knot complement is the only knot complement with hidden symmetries in volume less than six v naught. So v naught is the volume of the regular ideal tetrahedron in hyperbolic space. It's approximately one, and so this is approximately six. So this is saying. Um, there's only one knot complement of volume less than six, roughly, with hidden symmetries, and it's a figure eight knot. Okay. Um, so this is um, I, this is the first um, volume bound for obstructing knots from having hidden symmetries, other than the figure eight knot, with, which is, is minimal in volume, so is itself is itself a volume bound, but kind of a trivial volume bound. So, um, so that's my talk. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments on the NCNGT webpage, and I will happily answer them if I can. Thank you.